Good evening and welcome. I'm Dawn Lundy Martin. I'm director of the Center for African American Poetry and Poetics. Um, we call it CAP with two A's and two P's in case you're tweeting and Instagramming. I don't know if, you know, if you're going to be doing that inside of this building. The Wi-Fi reaches you, but if you do, it's two A's, two P's. Um, first, I want to thank you for coming. Um, this is an extraordinary evening with uh, Fred Moten and Latoya Ruby Frazier. Um, I also want to thank the Dietrich School of the Arts and Sciences and the Dietrich Foundation for its um, continuing support for CAP and its programming. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome our very special guest this evening. Uh, Fred Moten will present his work first. Latoya Ruby Frazier will present her work second, and then we'll have a, uh, an onstage conversation um, for about half an hour um, with a book signing to follow. And just as a reminder, the conversation is a part of the evening. So this is our first event at Heinz Chapel, uh, and it feels just right. Some years ago, before CAP was even a thought, I co-curated a little off-campus series with my friend, the poet, Suyin Juliet Lee, during her year teaching here at the University of Pittsburgh called Profana, where we brought together, uh, we brought the sacred dominion of the university that is intellectuals and also poets and artists into conversation at a black-owned book and record store in the Lawrenceville section of the city, hoping in some way to flip or disrupt the notion of inside and outside to privilege public space as necessary interloper to what happens within the confines of the academy. Tonight at Heinz Chapel, uh, I believe it's a non-denominational space for reflection and solace or respite perhaps from the repressiveness of the regime. We welcome two artists and thinkers whose work challenges the machinery of the regime and its inside out, upside down logics, its intentional and insidious omissions, its erasures and makings of monstrosities when it itself is the monster. Black thought and black making, of course, has a fraught relationship to the university. If the respite itself is a discursive manipulation that prefigures the public as an out there to be determined by those inside, then why not, as Fred Moten so profoundly works out in his work with Stefano Hardy, under Commons, why not go underground in the institution, like deep inside, operating fugitively to place its, in Moten's words, unsafe, neighborhood within the sacred. Um, as a poet and curator for the series, I'm interested in the discomfort and surprise and, of course, the innovation and genre and disciplinary adjacency. I'm interested in overlap and collusion. Uh, when we bring together a poet and a photographer and video artist, as we have tonight, what happens? What are the shared languages and where do we struggle to make sense of each other's sense-making? In this case, perhaps, where and how is blackness located in the work, if location is the right word, and how does this so-called blackness reach outside of the work into the social or an actual space and interactions with each other in our bodies or into meaning writ large? Some of this intercept and surprise will happen tonight, I suppose, in the mere placing of Frazier's uh, images and moving images next to Moton's poems and their commentaries around them. And of course, some will happen in the conversation that follows. Um, I'm drawn to Latoya Ruby Frazier's work for its provocative intimacy, what she calls a visual archive that documents and explores the intersection of the industrial impact of the steel mill on the health of her family and community in the industrial suburb of Braddock, Pennsylvania. Countering master narratives and revisioning the presence of black people in Braddock, Frazier interrupts media depictions of 
Braddock is desolate, violent, and drug-ridden. In places at the center of the conversation, black family and the effects of, of industry on life and health. The work is itself a detoxification in which images strip bare the vulnerability of the black body there by revealing our personhood. When I encounter Frazier's images, I'm brought so close to my own family, our own history and our present, I almost can't look. And this is one of the workings of great art, I believe, to surprise us and its effect on us, to change something in the way we relate to ourselves, which makes ourselves new, doesn't it? It's often uncomfortable, this process of rediscovery and transformation, as I believe any great art is. Subjectivities, as Fred Moten's poems indicate to be uncovered, however temporary, however unstable in the forms themselves and in the languages of the forms. What does a revolutionary language look like? How does it perform and by what means does it slip from our grasp, refusing to yield to the language rules that would have us exist in a blackness preconditioned and precontained by the logics of rationality? What Moten does in his collections of poems and I'm referring explicitly here to the field trio and the little edges, is find multiple meanings of, multiple means of stepping, if not outside, then certainly evasively beyond the grip of that containment. Uh, again, in the undercommons with uh, Stephen O'Hardy, um, which is kind of workbook toward resistance reflection, if it is a workbook towards resistance reflection, reformation of the world building project, the little edges in the languages uh, is the languages uh, we need to, to get there. So check out this disquiet um, and this incantatory rage in little edges. And this is a quote from that book of poems. Rapturous silence, shouting, composure, and listening so we decompose ourselves and one another lose your composure and repose at rest and descent in the general murmur, a general antagonism of noise, the fugue of the absolutely poor, her gift of divining, her depressive largesse of lifting and study and series, her overlapped happenings of attendance, lapsed concentricities, submerged ciphers like a bunch of little churches and ballrooms with open doors. You are the bottom. That's the end of that quote. We are not in this, uh, a witness in this space. We are in a feeling space, and this is a space that cannot be codified or delegitimized. This too is what great art does. I believe it eludes certain boxed-in knowledges. I love Moten's maneuverings outside of these boxes as if a breath into an open field that allows for you are the bottom and that gut feel too. So uh, please join me. You can find their full official bios on our website, of course. Please join me in welcoming first um, Fred Moten, and then Latoya Ruby Fraser. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is this, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? All right. <laughs> okay. um, thank you so much, Don. I appreciate it very much. It's just a pleasure and an honor to be here with Latoya and all of you. And, um, uh, I'm going to read some stuff that's pretty new. It's a kind of an extension of uh, some work from the Field Trio. Uh, the middle section of that book is called Come On, Get It, and this is a extension of that, that work. Um, so it's got numbers to it. Um, <clears throat> and I'll read the numbers. I'll try to remember to do that just to maybe help keep some kind of orientation. Um, 
I'm scared I'm gonna go over my time, so I'm gonna speed through it uh, if I can. 14, from Zora, Dara, world is dry land, earth is water. We posthumous and prenatal. The shit is posthumous and preternatural. In the muck, the swamp, on shore, wading, wading, wade, bathing. We laugh to keep from laughing like a tremendous submachine. The earthliness of black life is irreducibly marine. Digging is a kind of diving. Having been returned to the sea, we see that shit. Keeping our head above water so we can dive, dig. Amphibian, ungrounded, undergrounded, and our grounded life. At sea, adrift, as the prehistory of an already given fallenness, black life is wet. Like when Nate tends to certain fluidities of gait, the brutal clearing of land, forgetting the river's memory, Morrison says, in Mississippi. Sine says the escapist sings rose at summer while singing we never learn to swim, while black is whales. 14.1. What's it sound like to look at blackness, mixing poetry and criticism, hesitating forever to be a poet or a critic? This, they asked in protest of themselves, surrounded by themselves in bolts of blue. That smooth, honorable fabric don't feel so good. Whiteness is the set of interpersonal relationships. The interpersonal is an intrapersonal fantasy. The intrapersonal is an impersonal fantasy. The impersonal fantasy of the intrapersonal is your picture, imagination in the law of solitude. On the other hand, in which this same hand is held, off blue in extra personal folding. The image of hands held in folding, sociality, blackness, is unavailable, but the tangle, sociality, blackness, infuses every image. My black death is my debut, my stole. Done up in blueprint blue, it sure looks good on you. It just don't feel so good. 18. Gotta learn to see through things. Gotta learn to love being seen through. Things are transparencies, lenses, not like open caskets through American pictures, but what, in turning from the elusive, dilutional density of that thing, let lovers get down in the environment. The work is vestibular in its disappearance, when disappearance ain't just vanishing, but radical indivisibility that opposes itself in radical presence to the merely apparent, the disapparent. Radical presence is disappearance. It's like some lotion made of valerical steel or valerian oliver. What if the art world is just a formal conspiracy to make sure that the nothing that is seen through is displaced by things that can only be seen when they're the only things to see? What it is to see through a radical presence is obscured by desire for the monument, the mirror of the dead, which, with sound logic and absent morals, identifies transparent instrumentality as a degraded antagonist. The work is disappearing passage to the socio-ecological plane. Imagine an echo-musicological museology to arrange the scene you set in R and C. Stephen Feld's field, James Baldwin's scene. Why destroy a Schutz when you can destroy a Rembrandt? I used to know all these people who knew how to see through shit. Then I found myself here. 19, man is a singularity one all but can't help but believe in, but all can do it easy. Our shit is stoically subhistorical. 19.1, on the other motherfucking hand, neoliberalism in one aspect 
is a concerted attempt to obscure the essential and essentially exclusionary relation of identity and politics, which is better known as liberalism. It's a shame to where it comes from, a cold city built on a dry marsh. Lots of loose talk about hills and light, but here we come, the wet recrudescence of the marsh, the much more than malarial denizens of Le Marais, our anti and anti-aristocratic swarm. Disaggregated, we're constrained to use identity as a weapon against the zombies who invented it. Little pellets, bitter little old bullets, little bitty pullets, twiddle bullshitters. Our primary target is identity. This paradox lets us find ourselves. Enlightened, we're constrained to use politics as a weapon against murderers and their intentions. Our primary target is politics. This paradox obscures us. We try to protect ourselves from them and forget to protect us from ourselves. 19.2. Why is there something rather than nothing so devils can steal it? 20. Art militates against our terrible capacity to devolve into subjectivity. Violence is all it is. Beauty is the hole in what you see through. 20.1. World is a picture. A point of view is a picture's possibility. If one can occupy that point of view and take that picture, then one can be pictured too. This reflective picturing of space-time is Newton's physics and Kant's metaphysics doing the nasty, unmoved, without moving, or just not moving all that good. Meanwhile, here's Corrigenda for Gail Jones, for Gail Jones. Does, Cor does Corregidora come too correct, or is she a thing to be corrected? Does she bear correction? Must she bear correction? Is her bearing alive? Can she bear, as Alex might say, that orsinic inability to bear the music we bear? We got an ear for unbearable detail, as Alex might say. Can't stop, won't stop when we get enough. Can't call it, can't claim it, ain't mine. Sing it, can't say it. Run tell that degenerate sound, defective gourd and cold flow barren, unbjorn, baby. Mama, come on. Can't come, son. Won't come. It's a cold, cold coming. It's like ice around my heart. I know I'm going to quit somebody. Every time this feeling starts, we done made us some connections, then made us some corrections. We cut your hard and lonely will off. We wound your death and play that back as more than just not you. This you? Nah. It's just not you, my beautiful sister. Black is so much more than just not you, it hurts. Give me more, give me more, I want it, I like it. Party on fire, then I'm gone. Nothing to correct, cause it's all connected. Slave song isn't properly oppositional because it isn't properly autobiographical. All it tells us is nobody's story. Assuming the opposition generation after impossible generation. 20.2. As the word disguise coolly reveals itself, the concealment of identity misunderstood in the disavowal and displacement of appearance. Covered in a kind of uncovering, the mutual orbit of concealment and unconcealment, obscurity in relation, hiding and showing, disappearance and monstrosity, bad habit, strange habit, off in habitation. Anti-blackness ain't personal, but is it experienced personally? Is such experience real or true? No, it's way more fucked up than the real thing. Ain't nothing like that, as Aretha says they say, beautifully nothing like Marvin and Tammy say they say it. 21, hey 19, works of art are to be seen, but art only works if it's seen through. We got nothing in common. Our love is alive. It's queerness, 
It's gym-like quadraphenic black bitchiness. It's nothingness. It's its opacity. It's raggedy opulence. To be seen through is to can't help but move. Is there a book of gauze for which cinema prepares us? The anacinematic ain't a return to the book. It's the book's transparency. Dance of the turn and fold, not cut or tear, which ain't about rendering things transparent, but enacting the lucence through which we see no things. We see through things, a book of windows, an anaredactive loosening of leaves. Regarding this disregard in the open air, black art is criticism in the afternoon. 22, a war of our own device. 22.1, a festival of documentary consent. We give in groups. We've been in the music for a long time. Can you get that in a poem? Well, if it's in a poem, that's just poetry in a tight chemise. A band makes music. The making of the band is poetry. Where we stay is a folded sentence in the word you send. How can you make the making of the music sound good? Our practice is our theme. Sometimes it's commentary, sometimes inventory. Making ain't reducible to its conditions, but it ain't detached from them either. We make cars, the League of Black Revolutionary Workers might say, but really what we're making is the League of Black Revolutionary Workers all off and under and over the line. What Tom might say is, they thought I was making poems, but really we was making poetry. Want to keep seeing what we come to in the making. Skill got shared, so Tom is them. Tom and them. Them downstairs in a tremendous submachine of milk and cookies. To say them as a poet or a good poet narrows the scope of the shit in which they involve a threshold poetry hands when care and study get too deep. Neither the poet nor the poem can contain such virtue. What it is to be allowed to construct a question, to be allowed being also to be required, construct in an intention, fanned out all over the yard like some weighted canopies or a community saying of open corners or a conversion of the guards to hit a poem or a poet in the throat or in the stomach. It's a shame how them fucked up all them damn poets and them damn poems in there. Am I? I'm scared. I'm, anyway, I'll keep <laughs> And Malik and them's problematic of making, in dislocation, withdrawn, a discourse curved in the outskirts of black performance, left as an empty sequence. The name of this tune is Mississippi Goddamn and I mean every word of it. The way she says and is neither a bending of a note nor a slurring of two. It's an infinite end, endless, endlessly and unbendingly ribboned and turned in them, emphatically folded and not in between, unintegered, disintegrated with gratitude. To think Nina Simone as actor, Gunter Kaufman in Fassbinder's concern with Brecht's concern with gesture as dancer, Genre bent or slurred and neither. Is blackness a deeply energetic position from which to communicate or a deeply, deeply energetic apposition from which to announce communicability? Deep in these ongoing epilogomena to any future metaphysics, she had a wig on cocked to the side and she hummed every word of it. This experiment consists of this entangled state being shared between experimenters, each of whom has the ability to measure either with respect to the basis or we see that if they each measure with respect to, then they never see the outcome. If one measures with respect to and the other, they never see the outcomes. However, sometimes they see the outcome when measuring with respect to. Since this leads us to the paradox, having the outcome, we conclude that if one of the experimenters had measured with respect to the B, 
basis instead the outcome must have been or since and are impossible but then if they had all measured with respect to the basis by locality the result must have been which is also impossible and never even gone to emancipate oneself from oneself is the secret overpopulation of the mono instrumental imperative the composer's guild throws seed hill by hill in minimal dispersion this is liturgical rumination jalali and glossolalia jalal adin as discourse well here you go again you say you want your freedom but all you want to do is share deforming life in the terra form always a collective differentiation under firm terra somewhere i read you long to dispossess yourself of yourself what's the relation and or the difference between emancipation and dispossession i'd like there to be space between us and then also a crushing a pounding eastman alone says let sonorities ring which is what king did when he said let freedom ring way past the meaning of what he said being eastern man alone must we mean what we say mo meant to write no but mo mo better in the mo plus less than fullness of its articulation mo mean no plus yes which is more plus less than no motherfucker eastman un alone can't won't yeah is hearing a feeling standing over you like marx asking questions Cavell gives sharing as an individual affair. Your sharing seems different, either dispossessive of that individuality or held in that all but already given dispossession, the given having given itself away to never was. We got to forgive you, never even gone. Are you ever going to go? Give it up. Turn it loose. Still a player. We crush a lot. Pound plenty. what is a group group now 1690s originally an art criticism term assemblage of figures and or objects forming a harmonious whole in a painting or design from french group cluster group 17th century from italian gruppo group not which probably is with spanish gruppo from a germanic source from proto-germanic krupas round mass lump with an awkward dangling of sticks a brutal angling of brushes part of the general group of germanic kr words with the sense rounded mass such as crop noun but the roundness is blurred vibed pleated with ascots extended to any assemblage a number of individuals related in some way by 1736 meaning pop music combo is from 1958 and numberless never ones a one and a two and a bridge round ass lump or lumpen is from 1976 lumpen from lumen or inside lip a unit of luminous flux trilled in superficial kisses from an influenza of switches such as crew adverb a broken way people be sharply butterfly I want to do bad things to you groupin writing in a state of abandon is a dissertation defense a form of self defense groups a group of groups is there another is there anything other than the group or to be more precise is there nothing other than a group is there a size limit on groups when is a group too big to be a group this is the problem of scale murray jackson says philip levine's work is work is work always and of necessity group work what if it's not about putting shit together but about how shit falls apart communicability against the state another history of the group another history in this metaphysics the art of the fugue evil nigger difference got out of jail and died in the street saying this is grime the art of the upper room the art of the river rouge 23 doubleness of the begin is there any beginning the begin then wandering orvot 
the desire that drives one mad, the many to bear the broken. Contrafactum, substitution of text without changing the music, maintenance of a melody when the text changes, expands or contracts, requiring sustenance or melisma or double time. Is it too far to think the counterfacticity of King Pleasure and Eddie Jefferson or some kind of scattish counterfactotum, the sacred utility man, a one-man band emblematic of nothingness, scat man carousing, shining in the light that Brent resounds, Haidovich set to music, Hedwig made plain, Edwidge Danticek, a marinage of beginning, running, begging, praying, singing, dancing. But how the begin begin, and who the hell got there from here? What redirection, what rum, what rumba, what Ronald, what Rose Antoinette, what Martinique, what Jubilee? Come on, man, certain weird black ass white women evidently and some Berghards bogarding for the people. 23.1. Improvisation is how we make no way out of a way. Improvisation is how we make nothing out of something. 23.1.1. Some ways, that thing, is it the same thing to think and to be, to think and to do, to think and to feel? Let's say that already embedded in this Parmenidean series is the resistance to the very idea as well as the very regime of the epistemic, even as it's already scarred by it and being held in it, in its placement of thinking at the center of a relation that soon becomes a relational matrix. And isn't this brutalizing interplay of centrality and relationality in its very surreptitiousness part of what decoloniality wanted to be about the business of exposing and disavowing? This idea that thinking which is to say the thinker comes first, and everything else in this expulsive grasp that links and constitutes thing and else in severalty revolves around it as a problem of settlement, of the settler who brings the center with them, as them, everywhere they go. And today, the question is whether the idea or state or activity of bewilderment does anything to ameliorate it. The fact that we still here seems to indicate that we hope so. Cole Porter's Jubilee begins again, one more again. One. What if the problem isn't coloniality as an episteme? What if the problem is that coloniality is always already given in the very idea of the episteme? What if coloniality is the age or the locale or more precisely the space time of the episteme? Two. Is bewilderment an expression or a refusal of the epistemic? Is bewilderment in line with other notions, such as techne or doxa, that are said to deviate from the epistemic? Or is it something like the unconscious or the aesthetic that might be best characterized as deviant within the epistemic? Is coloniality or modernity the episteme of the episteme, where the constrained motion of from and within indicate a common terror, the general field of scientificity, which is space-time itself produced and then discovered? This Foucauldian question is not meant to advance against Foucault's grain an overarching anti-historicism. It is rather a question concerning the perhaps unconceivable but certainly still unconceived breadth of the very idea of the geographical historical as such unraveled in the begin, one more again, one, two, three. At stake is a general problematic of separation, in which case are we talking finally about decoloniality and bewilderment as modalities of partition within a spatio-temporal order, a geographical historical regime that is given in and as partition? I don't know. I'm bewitched, bothered. I'm Rogers and Hart and Ella. In this regard, ain't nothing new. Either need to let all that shit go or just, keep him go or just keep going all up in it without worrying about it or trying to name our way either out of it or innovatively within it. These probably amount to the same thing. Meanwhile, 
just since I woke up this morning, how many vicious thoughts have I thought about people with whom I agree on 99% of what they say and with whom I share 99% of their desires? I lost count. That's bad, and I really want to work on that. But I can't work on it by myself or in my head or in the interpersonal diorama, Diatoma, Jadviga, Hedwig, Edwidge, Hadowich, Set Edge, Set to Music, 24. Maybe the difference ain't between performance and practice. Maybe it's not between practice and playing. Maybe the difference is all inseparably inside out and unexternalizable. All and more and none and gone. Come on. Wow, that was incredible. Um, yeah, I kind of can't believe I'm here with Fred Moten. But uh, I appreciate the warm welcome uh, here to my hometown. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Don, Lauren, and uh, Fred for making this night of uh, sharing some true convictions and emotions uh, with everybody here and with each other. It was kind of a pleasure to see this image up here, uh, listening to Fred's words as well. Uh, that's actually the writer, the poet, the teacher, uh, a wonderful artist and photographer, uh, Sandra Gold Ford. Uh, I don't know if Sandra is in here tonight, but um, it's nice to hear Fred's words uh, bless her spirit and her presence in this cyanotype. So I'm actually going to read something that I thought uh, what Sandra said was really beautiful. During the time of us making on the making of Still Genesis, Sandra Gold Ford, which was the exhibition that just closed here in Pittsburgh at the August Wilson Center. The still mill is a metaphor for all of us. We are constantly going through this process of genesis and constantly coming into being, constantly evolving. Still is man-made item. Still is essentially iron, which occurs in nature, but still is superior to iron because of what people do to the iron. Metal that's M-E-T-T-L-E, -E, is the courage and willingness to stick with something, to endure, to strive. That's another human quality. So I see the two as similar, and that is really what I intertwine as I carry this work forward. The fact that we can make ourselves into steel. There are a couple of little sayings that apply this applied to this for me. One of them is, when you go through the fire, you either come out burnt or you come out fireproof. You get still by taking earth, air, water, and fire to make this metal that can't exist unless it is made. And we can make ourselves into stainless steel by taking the elements that we are born with and with some metal, we can make ourselves into stainless steel. That we can go through that same process and come out as steel. And that's Sandra Gold Ford, who is staring back at you right now in this beautiful place with her hard hat on with those amazing vintage goggles that all the, the steel mill workers wore to protect their, their eyes from the light. She's got on a lovely pen and she's holding pink granite. Pink granite being one of the earliest forms of the earth. And she's standing in her meditation room, which is in her home on Race Street in Homewood. And then she's standing there so beautifully in that African textile print with her lab coat on in front of a poster with a labyrinth where we went and walked the labyrinth here in East Liberty 
at the historic church that's there. And also another poster, that's a poster of the commission work she shot for Pittsburgh Magazine in the 80s. So this woman has a, a very large, in-depth universe within her. And I think what was beautiful about about wanting to pay homage to her in this exhibition was getting to know her and seeing her routine as a retired steel mill worker who was uh, worked clerical but was also a chemist. Sandra could tell you exactly how to make steel. She knew every single machine. She knew how everything worked. She knew everyone's schedule. So when you would walk into August Wilson Center, um, you would be confronted by that beautiful portrait of her standing in front of all the stars in the universe in her other room, which was her office. Conceptually, the exhibition, it goes through, of course, the history of photography, but it also goes through um, looking, taking a very deep, investigative, archaeological dig. Uh, that first image is her standing in her bedroom in, a, in another meditation room with pictures of her children. The middle image is a photograph that she made at Jones and Laughlin Steel Factory, which it, it runs along the Monongahela River on the North Shore and the South Side works. It was two locations. That photograph has the scrolling marks written into a steel staircase that says, pensions please. Next to it are the magazines that were the covers from the Men of Steel. At this point, these are very um, collectible magazines. And underneath are death records. Um, they are also grievance reports. And there are also blueprints. And what was interesting about making the work physically is that I was inside of Pittsburgh Filmmakers in the middle of the night all night um, using their machine that was very much, um, it existed during the period that the factory would have come into existence. So we know that Carnegie's first factory started in 1875. And so this machine that I was using to make my cyanotype prints inside of Pittsburgh filmmakers existed the same period. So as a photographer, an artist, as someone looking at history, the medium that I work with, the material that I'm working with, reinforces the aesthetic, the content, and the subject matter. Blueprints were used first by botanists. They were looking at plants and thinking about ecology. You know, to see Sandra in a blueprint, in a cyanotype, connecting the ecology, right, the human body, the ecological disaster that we're constantly facing underneath industrial capitalism and the history of steel and coal mining and these industrial capitalists that keep having more uh, power and glory than the working class and then the women that continue to take care of the men or birth the labor force in and of itself uh, is interesting to me to stand there and in this laborious way keep making all of these cyanotype prints using the plate maker machine. Now in order for me to make these prints, I had to first shoot them. So there are images that I shot on film that had to be developed, right? Silver highlight turned on film that then had to be digitized and scanned. And then from the scan turned into a transparency. Then I had to set those aside and then take chemicals that I made fresh from powder that I had to get government clearance because some of these powders make explosives. These are also weapons they are very dangerous. So mixing those chemicals together, I was able to create this, what looks like a yellow uh, liquid that I then took paper and I coated it with, right? These are about 30 by 40 inch pieces of paper that I'm coating repeatedly with these explosive chemicals that look yellow. Now, once you sandwich the transparency of the image on top of the paper and you close it in a plate maker and you expose it to ultraviolet light, what you get when you put it in the water is this beautiful blue. Blue as in blue collar, blue as in the working class. 
blue is in the blues that Anna Atkins was using when she was looking at the early plants as a botanist. Here in this image is the cover from the Men of Steel, but the image that's next to it, it is actually an image and not a Xerox piece of paper. I took documents, and what was beautiful about Sandra is she saved. She had the foresight and the courage to save all of the documents that belonged to Jones and Lachlan that LTV, who took over the company, was shredding and throwing away. You see, they had already squandered all the pensions from all the workers, so most of us who are born and raised here are descendants of that fact. We understand that there are so many debts that people can't afford to pay back because they didn't owe them in the first place. Their pensions were stolen, and they were stolen because Jones and Lachlan had the best retirement, the best in the world, and this businessman wanted to make an example out of it. And that's why they broke it apart. And that paper there that's next to that magazine cover is the original letter that I turned into a cyanotype that explains to all of these steel mill workers that their pension would not be given to them. So Sandra, along with all of these steel mill workers at Jones and Lachlan, were fired, lost their jobs, and did not have their pension. Sandra also happens to be the person who, for 10 years, published the Shooting Star Review. You can find these here in the libraries. They've been digitized. And so some of the earliest people that wrote were people like Mary Baraka, uh, Langston Hughes. August Wilson was on the board of this magazine which is why I thought it was really beautiful to come full circle in a triangle, right? Sandra, August Wilson, and me in the August Wilson Center, where I'm honoring a woman who is honoring the working class. Another beautiful thing was watching Sandra continue as a retired steel mill worker to still create in her home. This is the top floor. This is where she does all her writings. So this is her writing room. And I would be sitting right behind her scanning all these documents that she saved and just making all these noises when I came across things like the pension letter. And she was sitting there working on three different novels. I want to read this to you. This is one of Sandra's photographs. The mills that grind and grind and grind away the lives of men their stats are great black silhouettes against the sky. In the dawn, they belched red fire, the mills grinding out new still old men. That's Langston Hughes, Steel Mills, 1916. You know, I must say, considering that we're coming up on um, 50 years and Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday just passed in the holiday. I constantly keep thinking about the three evils, you know, the speech that ultimately got him killed. And so, you know, what I want you all to be thinking about as you look at these images, and I continue to speak in triptychs and trinities and triads and groups of threes, is to think about what those three evils are. Materialism, militarism, and racism. Because these are the things that are always on my mind and why I feel the urge and the need to revise history and to keep ushering and moving and bringing, right, painting with light, bringing these bodies, these black bodies, these women, these men, these children into existence for the world to see. This was an influential image by Gordon Parks. This is Ella Watson cleaning an office in Washington, D.C. in one of the government buildings. Ella Watson was probably only making $15,000 a year, raising her children, grandchildren, and a foster child, cleaning a white woman's office in the government building where no one ever noticed her. Parks noticed her one day. This was in 1945, and he decided to redo the American Gothic painting but with Ella standing in front of the American flag holding the mop and the broom. 
And when I first saw this image in my undergrad photo class, it really pricked me because I realized in that moment that I wanted to be an artist that could speak through images. I realized that you could speak through a photograph, right? It's not about taking a picture. It's about making a photograph where you are communicating something to that audience and viewer. The other paradigm that came up for me in terms of threes is the iconic migrant mother image. When that image went around class, everyone kept saying, Dorothea Lange, Dorothea Lange, and the image got to me, and I said, well, who is the woman in the photograph? What is her name? None of us knew her name. I would learn that her name was Florence Owens Thompson. She never received any payment or royalties from this iconic proliferated image that has gone around the globe. Dorothea Lange herself was fired from the assignment by the government, by the corporation led by Roy Stryker because she wanted to include her field notes as to how she ended up making this image with this woman. So two women silenced, history stolen and taken out of context, a real truth never provided for the American public. Another trinity that I come back to is understanding whoever John Fraser is, I have traveled to Scotland to go to the Paris records to find out. I only came back to learn that all history is fiction. But John Frazier and this plaque existed before the camera was invented, so there's no image, there's only a plaque. I'm in the middle, dressed in my Grandma Ruby's best, pigtails and baby doll shoes and a doll dress, which is why I wear suits now. And Andrew Carnegie the great industrial capitalist that I think is the best social practice artist because he's still ruling our lives from the grave. <laughs> I had to make this triptych because I wanted to see myself with them, right? This is a part of my heritage. This is a part of my culture. This is a part of my identity. So why wouldn't I be seen or heard? I should have also known that I would have become someone that cared about the environment because this is the signage, the welcome sign from the 1980s that I would see every time I came home. You drive underneath the Rankin Bridge and you come into Braddock down Braddock Avenue and there it was. All those companies that were polluting that small town along the Monongahela River. This is Grandma Ruby's, um, this is Aunt Midgey and Grandma Ruby, 2005. The one in the pigtails is my grandmother when she was 16. The person in the middle is my Aunt Midgey, and that's also my Aunt Midgey when she was a baby next to it. Here's what Braddock looks like today. So unlike what you hear in the media, especially if you were someone who came from Brooklyn because you got priced out, this is not a pasture. It's not a post-industrial town. It's an industrial suburb. And I've spent the last 14 years trying to make this 14-year body of work that is my expression of what it means to come of age in a post-Reagan era. Although it looks like a landscape, to me, this is actually scars on the landscape. The history of a place is written on the body and the landscape. If you want to know the truth about a place, look at its inhabitants and look at the environment. I hear that Braddock is about to be rebranded yet again as the uh, East Shore. Braddock, Rankin, Swissville. Mom, that means I got to move you again. But the irony of calling something the East Shore when 300 acres along one mile strip along the Monongahela River is being barricaded by the United States Steel Corporation Edgar Thompson plant, which also just got clearance to release more chemical emissions in the air. And also I'm reading that they have possibly begun fracking on the site. So tell me politicians, what East Shore? You know, at the rate that Braddock changed generationally between my grandmother, who grew up when it was a melting pot and prosperous in a large city, 
and my mother who grew up there in the 60s during the height of segregation and white flight, and when I grew up there during the war on drugs, you would have thought the government would have been victorious at killing us, but it didn't. We're still here, steadfast, graceful, and we've endured a lot of injustice and inequality. Because my family is not the Cosbys, which you see the faded image of Bill Cosby on the t-shirt, of course our names and our family will never be written in American history or talked about by the celebrities or on the mainstream news reportings. So it became essential for me to write my own book, basing the work off of the Sweet Fly Paper of Life, the collaboration between Roy De Caraba and Langston Hughes. I spent the last three years turning that into a book of images that kind of wove together the pollution, the toxicity, the glory, the life, all the different generations. The arc of the book happens when my grandmother dies in UPMC Braddock Hospital and we watch the hospital be torn away by UPMC who claimed that it was underutilized and losing money, which was a lie. The irony about Pittsburgh is that UPMC is now in the USX Tower. It's the first thing you see when you enter through the tunnels. I want to play this video clip for you. And it could be from tap water, swimming, showering, um, not washing your fruits and vegetables well. But if you notice what looks like black chips all through here, you see them kind of separated out over here. There's some more in there. There you go. You can see them look like pepper. That's all heavy metal that has come out of your system. That could be, again, our number one source of drinking water. So we shouldn't be drinking, you know, drinking water. We should be having some type of purified water. But it could even be from vaccinations or vaccines or injections, anything. Because the preservative they use is that thimerosal, which is a mercury-based derivative, so that's it's fixing your system. And like you guys didn't live down downwind from the mill or something, did you growing up? Down to Yeah, my system. But picked a lot of the metal up from the steel mill. You know, because it's atomized in the air, you never realize you're breathing it and exposed to it. So that was my mother and I getting an ion foot bath cleanse. Uh, like many people, we were skeptics and we didn't think it was real. But also the flip side to that is the level of discrimination that we face with the medical field and doctors and UPMC kind of gave way to this other experimental way of thinking about our health. But when we saw the metals uh, floating in particular, that was my foot bath where all those metals were floating on top. So it's interesting in the arc of 14 years of looking at my hometown that in that foot bath was the town coming out through the pores of my feet, the metal itself. And the other thing I want to point out, um, what's really precious to me is the local history of Pittsburgh and the local history of Braddock. Often artists go to big cities like New York and LA and they want to reinvent themselves and forget where they came from. Well, I'm such a stubborn person, I do the opposite. And so, of course, when I saw this book, I realized that making the notion of family was bigger than me, it was bigger than my mother, and it was bigger than my grandmother. It was about correcting an, an, a real social injustice in history. But also, I was thinking about people like Thomas Bell and what it must have been like for him when he immigrated to work in the factory. Thomas Bell would go on to become a novelist and a writer in New York. I was uh, thinking about Dennis C. Dickerson, who worked in the mill but became a historian. And he also was the first one to prove that African Americans were there from the beginning. So I hope this book is here in the library because black people were here from the beginning contributing to steel. And my other hometown hero, Tony Buba and uh, Ray Henderson, right? All of our lives have been touched and impacted by Braddock, Carnegie, the steel mill, 
And I want to embrace that and honor that always in all of my work. So of course it made sense after understanding these wonderful four men that came before me that I would make this photo history book in conversation to put women, their lives, their perspectives, their bodies in that context. So what I want to close on is the work that I made on Flint. Um, you know, this is a cover from 1968 done by Gordon Parks for Life magazine. I would have never thought in a million years that I would end up making the image next to it of little Zion at eight years old having to brush her teeth with bottled water in Flint, Michigan. It looks like nothing has changed. How could an image from 68 and an image in 2017 look similar? So I was commissioned by Hearst Corporation and Elle Magazine. They asked me had I been following the water crisis and if I would be interested in building out a social documentary section for a fashion magazine September issue. This work ran in the September issue of Elle. Ten uninterrupted pages, five uninterrupted spreads, right before you got to the fashion spreads in the September issue. And I'm emphasizing this because that is a big moment in fashion and in magazine industry. So if they're giving you uninterrupted pages, that's a huge platform. Now, my ignorance almost caused me not to do this. But then I started thinking about Gordon Parks. Gordon did it all. He shot fashion, but he also showed the segregation in America, the violence in America, but he also did fashion. So I thought about him even further. And the two works, the things that are important to me is the way that photographers have collaborated with poets. So I showed you the example of Sweet Flag Paper of Life with De Carava and Hughes, but this time with Shay Cobb, I was thinking about Ralph Ellison, Gordon Parks, and The Invisible Man. Again, revising and updating and speaking to my predecessors. Being three women, Shaykov is a poet, a singer, a bus driver, a student at the University of Michigan Flint, and I'm a photographer. And so I really started looking at the collaboration between Ellison and Parks, The Invisible Man, but it never ran. It was supposed to run in the magazine of the year and the magazine went bankrupt and they lost all the negatives in the lawsuit. So again, a story and expression never revealed to the American public. That work in particular was about looking at Harlem based on Harlem is nowhere. And it was about the, the visualization of the psychology of racism, what racism does to people psychologically. There was no way that I would have known anything about Flint. It was the opposite. I spent 14 years photographing my own family and hometown. So it took me five months of going back, tracing all of Shay's routines, bus routes, everything that they did, everywhere they went, everywhere her family lived, all the different neighborhoods repeatedly. I even went as far as to take the images back to Shay and sit down with a recorder at a table with her and let her articulate what those images were. The beauty is that her family, the Cobb family, had a wedding during the water crisis. She told me, don't think about coming here getting victimized images and us in tattered clothes. We don't do that. So that's the twist. Whereas the mainstream media would have thought that I would have told a story and showed them as victims, Instead, they got a wedding that happened in a courthouse. And then there was the day that Obama came. He came to Northwestern High School to correct Governor Snyder in front of the public and for the TV. A total propaganda stunt. You would think that these children would be allowed in their own high school to witness this historic moment. They weren't. They were kept outside. Police officers came, took caution tape in front of them, told them if they stepped off the sidewalk, they pointed up 
at the roof of the high school. And who was up there? Snipers with rifles. And they told them if they came off those sidewalks that they would be shot. And so I want you to understand what that says. An over-militarization of a community already abandoned by the automobile industry, by its own government. A community that had its American democracy taken from it when Snyder decided to override the citizens' vote not to switch to the Flint River. To this day, they still have not had their pipes replaced. They do not have drinking, clean drinking water. It's been approximately over 1,364 days since they have had clean water. They are still bathing in bottled water, brushing their teeth in bottled water, cooking in bottled water, or just using it while it's damaging them. And I just want to read a couple of very specific facts about it, and then I'm going to play this two-minute clip from Shay. As Flint residents are forced to drink, cook with, and even bathe in bottled water while still paying some of the highest water bills in the country for their poisoned water. In 2001 and 2002, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality issued permits to Nestle, the largest water bottling company in the world, to pump up to 400 gallons of water per minute from aquifers that feed Lake Michigan. Nestle is not required to pay anything to extract the water, besides a small permitting fee to the state and the cost of, lease, of the leases to a private landowner. In fact, the company received 13 million in tax breaks from the state to locate the plant in Michigan. The spokesperson from Nestle in Michigan is Deborah Muchmore. She's the wife of Dennis Muchmore, who is Governor Rick Snyder's chief of staff, who just retired and registered to be a lobbyist. Corporations and industrial capitalists and politicians being more important than people. One other thing I'll say. Although lead is a risk factor for developmental and behavioral problems, its impact varies significantly by individual and may be affected by the psychosocial environment and educational experiences of the developing child. Given the disproportionate risk for low-income children and families, the impact of lead exposure in communities like Flint can be enormous. As pediatricians know, however, the risk of exposure continues, particularly in older homes and communities. Lead can remain in household dust, in deteriorated lead paint, in soil that children unintentionally ingest through the normal hand-to-mouth behavior, or in water that is supplied through lead pipes, as we saw in Flint. Children can also be exposed to lead from their parents, who have been exposed to lead in the workplace. This is Amber Hassan, Shay Cobb, McConnell Roxy, and I standing in front of a, a collection, a message that we wrote spelled out in hundreds of bottles of uh, Nestle water bottles. And I want to close this out by if I can get out of this full screen. Uh, playing this video. When you think about water, you don't consider government. In fact, you don't consider people at all. Even though we built plants and machines to alkalinize and purify, when you think about it, you only in your most remote mind, if at all, think about God, something nature intended. 
When you think about water, you don't consider poison. Because poison isn't something you consider for yourself. You don't think about murder. So when you think about water, you never consider self-destruction. And even though these considerations are not to be had, it is the reason I am becoming the Tin Man. Stiff, hollow, and heartless. Because that's the destiny of a dry body. Clanging tap dances and emotional breakdowns because the tears is the closest to lubrication that you'll get. Without the oil can, we're just sitting, singing, let my people go. Another freedom song. Because the echoes of them old fields been long gone, but we remember them. We think about them backs that harvested our future irrigations, and we consider only masses plantations. And how keeping them niggas in one place without fair law and fair play just makes for good old fashioned American life. And I'm pointing the finger, because I read them inconvenience letters, and I read them notices. And before I even ever paid a bill, I was still treated like a bottom feeder, like my taxes don't contribute to their vacations and secret sanctions. I was treated like I ain't American. Because when you think about water, you think about Flint, and you line it up to Willie Lynch, and you place that name on Snyder's face to noose that face only to watch yourself hang. What would I do if I could taste God? What would I do if death wasn't served by steel rod? What would I do if my baby was going to be safe and sound? What would I do if disease wasn't plaguing my town? What would I do if I could feel water trickle down my spine without drying me out? What would I do if I wasn't self-destructing? What would I do if I could feel? Shea Cobb, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Those are both really fabulous. Um, I, you know, I'm going to start actually with a kind of wide lens. Um, I want to begin with a question about creativity. Uh, maybe it's a question about black creativity without a desire to reduce blackness to a noble quality of being. And I'm referencing the creative impulse and the ability to make something in the midst of attack, annihilation, devastation, deportation, rape, uh, the absence of water, uh, the absence of health care, etc., uh, which strikes me as a thing akin to escape from the inescapable. So I was wondering if you just talk a little bit about how the creative manifests as a response. Uh, or how that emerges given the conditions that surround it. Uh, why create instead of destroy? Um, well, I guess. My sense of it, maybe a kind of almost sort of Dada sense of it, is that I don't know that creativity and destruction are really opposed to one another. I think they're all bound up with one another. Um, you know, and it's why it is that maybe, um, you know, my, my sense of it has always been, you know, some folks want to think or they want to maybe think that other people might think that the black art, say, or black music is a form of amelioration or compensation um, for violence. And my sense of it always has been that it is a, a way of documenting violence and um, in a way of, in a certain sense, preserving violence and maybe even, hopefully, a way of transforming or turning maybe the direction of fit of that violence against the grain of maybe um, the forms of brutality that, that helped it produce the conditions of it. So, you know, it's not that the music isn't supposed to make you feel good. It's just that it's also, I think, supposed to make other things feel bad. Um, it's supposed to, you know, it, it's a challenge and a disruption. Um, uh, you know, not only to 
already existing, you know, structures of power and force and brutality, but a challenge and disruption to us insofar as we reflect or um, accept or internalize or help to disperse and distribute those, those forms. So. Um, I think about uh, a, a couple of things. I mean, making the notion of family for 14 years, I was definitely self-destructive to myself, you know, while I was making it. Um, you know, but the person that you see sitting here that just spoke today isn't that person in those photographs. Uh, you know, it was something that my mother actually said to me. My, my mother and father are here right in the front. Uh, and I'm really proud of that. Uh, this is the first. Uh, you know, I made a photograph of my mother one day. She asked me to make this portrait. And she said to me when I printed it and came home, because I would always come home with my contact sheets and uh, eight by 10 resin coated papers to show my mom and my grandmother. And she pointed at the image and she said to me, I wanted you to make this photograph because the moment you took that picture, it was no longer me. And that's the whole problem here. I'm not the person in those photographs. Now, I'm up at Syracuse University studying Roland Barthes. And my mom just said to me, the theory of death in a photograph, <laughs> right? And this is why I always believe that life, you know, is the experience and the criterion for knowledge. You know, what is theory if you're not applying it to real daily lives? And uh, something that really impacted me in terms of documentary work and what you're starting to say about documenting or why create instead of, you know, destroy. You know, if it wasn't for the photographs that Lewis Hine made here in Pittsburgh, when they did the survey, people wouldn't have known about the condition of working class people's lives. You know, and it was through that creativity of making those images that child labor laws came into existence and also a lot of changes. I mean, we still need to work on many more changes, but that was essential and important that he documented that. And the last thing is, um, you know, James Baldwin's creative process. I usually read it everywhere I go. But I think James Baldwin is right, that the artist is present not to obey or, or be in league with politicians and with the state. I mean, we're here to, you know, put up that mirror and show the truth and the knowledge to what people are afraid of, which are basic things like death, love, suffering. And um, the last thing, when Lyndon B. Johnson founded the National for Endowment for the Arts, it was founded because he was hopeful that people who didn't know each other and were indifferent to each other could potentially be able to learn from one another and see each other's humanity, possibly. But we see that the National Endowment for the Arts is under attack under this administration, and so are the arts. It's like we're back in McCarthy era. So, yeah, so it's not you in the actual photograph, um, but there is a, as I experience the photographs, there's like a, there's an intimacy, and I would imagine that there's a kind of vulnerability, um, and something is revealed. Um, and so I'm wondering about that, I guess, in the making of the work, in the exhibition of the work, um, that relationship, really, between uh, you know what, how the the, the image or the, the person is transformed in the work, the experience of vulnerability in making it, and then what's revealed in it for you, um, especially the work that about um, in the notion of family. Yeah, I mean, when I look at the book now, I think that I made that book. Uh, like I'm speaking to my younger self. Like if I could have answered those questions by process of making, by process of doing the act of making those images, I was providing an answer. Uh, what it meant to kind of try to, 
you know, stumble and fumble around to find my own identity and, and perspective and voice between two very powerful women like my mother and my grandmother. Um, also refuting the fact that we live in a society that devalues black women. No one believes us when we say anything. Constantly being questioned or just completely not seen because they don't, they see you as less than an equal and less than human, right? I can be a photo teacher in my photo class, but those students will walk in and they'll say, where's the teacher? I am the teacher. I am the professor. Um, and I do think going back to what Sandra Goldford said, right, we're also, we're always in the process of becoming, uh, in this process of being, you know, film and gelatin silver prints themselves are just silver celluloid. It's light. It's not tangible. So, you know, to make yourself appear uh, seemingly fixed on a piece of paper, right? Even that isn't fixed. Nothing is fixed or stable under heaven, right, as Paul once says. And this is the same for the photograph. Right. You want to respond to that? Um, well, I think um, well, one of the things that kind of fascinates me about um, well, photography in, in general, but, but your work in particular, and I, fascinates not even the right word. It's, it's a, it's a, there's a better word for it that I just can't think of right now. Uh, fascinates. No, how about one thing that just messes me up? <laughs> is um, I mean, you know, I I I have my own sort of Pittsburgh connection to it. I've been very much sort of feeling the last two days being here. One of the reasons why I'm so grateful about the chance to be here is my mom. Uh, when I was 14, we moved to Pittsburgh from my hometown, from Las Vegas. My mom went, went back to graduate school here at Pitt. And, and so, um, and one of the things that happened is that after, as she was finishing up her school, she worked for this sort of CETA program, you know, like kind of one of those last remnants of Johnson's War on Poverty, you know. Um, and in a way, it's, it's almost like maybe, um, you weren't even born, but it was, in a way, the, the, the moment within the, and, and as you say, deindustrialization isn't the right word. I don't know what the right word is. Um, but, uh, but, but, on, but along with the Monongahela River, you know, where she worked with the folks who were being displaced, um, you know, dispossessed of the chance to work, you know, um, and so, I went along some of those towns too, you know, Clanton, Homestead, and, and 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 so when I see, it's funny. I, I saw, as you say, these 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 sort of triplets that you make, these 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 trios that are constantly infusing your work, you and your mom and your grandmother, and it makes me think so much of me and my mom and my grandmother, because uh, we were sort of a, a trio like that too. Um, but also Shay and her mom and her daughter, Zion and Flint pictures. And so there's this way in which even though at the same, there's this, at the same time that you're saying, well, I, I'm not the same person as I was in those photographs and your mom's not the same person as she was in those photographs. Somehow, strangely, without you ever having known me and my mom, I'm in those photographs. Um, and obviously it produces all kinds of complications insofar as it's not within the context of this sort of three generations of women. I mean, who am I? Where am I? Even like, what's my own gender and sexual identification within those things? I'm such a mama's boy. I mean, I'm so marked. I've been so fundamentally handed, you know, as Hortense Spillers would say, by my mom and by my grandma, and I can't. They're with me so much. They're like in my body, they constitute so all of those things come to my mind 
when I look at your photographs and I see miraculously, you know, myself and my mom and my grandma. That is, that's a good segue, because I want to talk about the number three. Which, I, you know, so, you know, after our conversation yesterday, um, I did some research on the number three, but then I went down some research hole, and now I can't, you know, bring all of that in because it was kind of too much. It's, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but I'd be remiss not to ask you about three, and so I'm thinking about Fred the Field Trio, organized in three sections. Yesterday, Latoya, you said that you like to work in threes and triads, and then you said trinities, which made me think I was like, oh, we're going to be in this church. It made me think of the Holy Trinity, God the Son, the Holy Ghost. The impossibility of that three beings one god too and um also thinking about how i like impossibilities um and uh when i said yesterday that i often think of threes and lists and poetry and when i recognize that happening i'll add a fourth thing and latoya you were horrified you're like four seems so finite <laughs> uh, and fred and the field trio the mystery of three seems to as well indicate a refusal to cohere and it has something i think to do with the blues uh, but also irreconcilability and inability to be represented um, seems to be related in terms of the forms that your poems take. So I was hoping you both could talk about three, the significance of your work. I don't know. This Three is it's crazy. It's like, um, I can't even help it. <laughs> it's so sick now that I have to figure out all these ways to make three go evenly into 10 and 11. <laughs> um, um, like I got, <laughs> you know, three trilogies. I'm working on two trilogies, each of which are made out of five books. So how does that work? So I, don't, I don't think I'm such a Trinitarian, you know. Uh, but uh, things running through my mind again because it's like a Pittsburgh memory. First concert I went to was Harlem Funkadelic, and the old Pacific Arena isn't even there anymore. It was there, but uh, it was uh, Doctor the Funkenstein, too, you know, and came out of George Clinton King out of the top of the Civic Arena in a spaceship with a diaper on it, you know. And I just remember that was some make my talk about. I've been grooving on y'all phone for a while. Groove managing game groove. It sounded like it got a three on it to me though. Like, what's happening? You know, so maybe that's the origins of the mystery of the three. What did George Clinton mean when he said it sounded like he got a three on it to me? So, <laughs> Um, yeah, I think just my experience and how I came of age. So, you know, it was always the three, me, my mother, my grandmother. Um, then it would be me, my grandmother, and JC, my younger cousin. Uh, but then it's also being in proximity as a black body walking in the city and space, understanding that you are enclosed by the three rivers, right? The Allegheny, the Mahalo, the um, understanding that, you know, it's an ancient river, it's sacred, this was indigenous land. Um, it's very spiritual for me, um, especially because when I came back one day, I started shooting landscapes. See, it started off with the domestic portraits, then it turned into the still lifes, then it turned into the landscapes and the aerial views. And I came down Ninth and Talbert one day and I just looked on the side of this church and it said, you must be born again of water and spirit. And it just seemed like every time I was looking at the landscape, I was always being reminded, you know, in this spiritual sense, maybe even more. Uh, and I think, you know, since everyone's so obsessed with Du Bois only being on race, they kind of forget that he's like a feminist and an environmentalist. And I found this amazing speech that he gave in 1930 at, at his high school about the Housatonic River in Great Barrington. He warned his school and his cl former classmates about how they polluted 
the Housatonic River, how this community turned its back on the river, and that that river is that backbone of that town. And look at what you've done to it. I know there's a lot of ways, like saying, like the shutting off of its uh, shuttering brooks and dumping, you know, all this waste in it, like really let them have it. Uh, and it just kept reminding me, in fact, it was that speech that caused me to charter a helicopter and follow the Monongahela River down to the point. And so I think it's uh, instilled in me through the environment, the landscape, and how I was raised, it follows around the threes, that, um, you know, that's kind of where the transcendence happens for me. Um, I'm going to give the audience a heads up that I'm going to ask two more questions and then you will be allowed to ask questions. There is a, a microphone <laughs> in the center of the uh, room. And so you will ask your questions from there. I guess I'll ask one more question. You learn better? One? Okay, one. Um, so, uh, okay, which one? Um, I guess. Um, I'll, I'll reference our conversation again that we had yesterday over lunch, and we were talking about uh, what's missing, what's gone, and I believe what Toye said the phrase, orienting oneself via absence, uh, which I just, you know, I jotted down, that's, that stuck out to me, and Fred, in, in your book, um, The Undercommons, which I often call a workbook for some reason, um, you're working to deal with what you call the false image of enclosure. Uh, so I'm thinking about both presence in response to erasure and reorienting in response to the false image of enclosure. Um, and in poetry, one of the ways that we get to meaning is via the gap, right? It's via the space uh, in between what's said. And uh, so this is an open-ended question. I'm, I'm hoping you could both talk about that space in between uh, and, and how your work seeks to negotiate it, or that space on the other side of absence uh, or in relation to absence and toy. For me, um, absence is presence, is the only way I know how to say that. Uh, the way that the shadows show up in all of my work. Right, this the stark contrast between the highlights, the midtones, and the shadows. The shadows actually become the foreground. They become the protagonists. Right, the shadow is the character. Like if you think about an image, like um, mommy silhouettes, or uh, mom and me, the series that my mother and I made together, a portrait. I come back to that image of mommy shadow in parentheses is what I ended up, up calling it because that's the moment it hit me about absence and presence. That image was, to me, the foreshadow of the loss of my grandmother. I didn't see it coming. Um, I was not prepared the moment it happened, because the way my grandmother always was, she told me she would tell me when, and she didn't. And going back to that image after losing her, and I'm speaking about this because this is, this day marks uh, this moment uh, marks nine years since she passed. Um, and the mommy silhouette was really the last image my mother and I worked on in 2010 in a very playful manner. It almost looks like a window itself or like this tapestry and our shadows are casted on to this bed sheet that really has like plants and birds on it. Right, so textile, ecology, body, femininity, ecofeminism. But these shadows, they're there, and they're the most important thing. And the, the other thing for me is the absence of the men in my work is actually their presence. I think being from this region, most of us have always had to grapple with, A, your grandfather or your father or even your brother have fought in the wars for this country. Right? And even if they do come back, you have to consider things like PTSD and just if are people really ever even present with each other, even when you're enclosed in these same rooms, or the fact that they work in the mill and they die in the mill, like we see in all the documents from Sandra Gold Ford, where you see these men falling in labels, you know, and dying, bodies turned to like some kind of metal film, because that's what happens when a human flesh hits the, the hot heat of of molten steel, 
right? You just become a former shadow of yourself. So everything is always, for me, presence and absence is bound in the shadow in the darkest form. And that's very Baroque for me. I like deep shadows and texture and detail in the shadow. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know how much I can add to that, but I, I've always also, I guess, you know, been interested in the, in the fullness, so to speak, of, of absence. Um, you know, and, and uh, or another way to put it would be, you know, in the presence of what's gone or who is gone, um, who it is or what it is that you're walking around with, and, you know, and also, what it is that you're walking through, um, and what it means to acknowledge, you know, and to try to understand and to try to see, um, not only what shows up, you know, or what what doesn't show up to a normal kind of scene, but also what it means constantly to be allowed to see through what it is that doesn't show up to our normal scene. You were talking about how it is that a Photograph, you, you can speak through the photograph. And I think what's really brilliant and amazing about your work, too, is that it, you can see through it as well. You can't, you can see it, obviously, but you can also see through it to what's, you know, for lack of a better term, not there, but remains there, it's still, still present there. Um, and I think, for me, that's the highest kind of compliment you can give to to art, you know, it's one thing to, to constantly be confronted with the presence of the work of art um, in ways that are almost uh, aggressive, you know, forms of art which put themselves in front of you and kind of won't, won't get out of your way. And then there are other forms of art which, it's not that they're transparent, but they do constitute a kind of brilliant, you know, really elegant form of opacity they allow you to see through them, not only to aspects of the world or of history that, that don't seem readily available to most kinds of vision, but they also allow you to see through to, to how the world, you know, to how things might be. Um, and, and, and that's the most important and the most uh, far-reaching form of documentary. You know, it's what documents what has been, but it also documents in some weird, amazing way what's going to happen, too. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, we do have some time limitations. I was, I've been engaging in the illusion of infinite time, but I guess that's not the thing I should be doing. If, uh, if there is uh, someone who has a pressing question, someone who came here to ask Fred and Latoya a question and really, really want to ask it, you should. We need a microphone, though. We won't be able to hear you, I don't think. Can someone bring... Uh... Well, I oh, you, oh, you, okay. So. Oh, you, okay, for Jeff, do it. All right. Um, so, first of all, thank you so much for all that. I'm completely blown away, and, and I'm very appreciative. Um, I'm curious. Your work uh, points out a lot. Um, and I'm wondering if you have seen or noticed some of the same uh, signs of encouragement that humanity is really thirsting for profound change in a positive direction. And are you made as hopeful by those signs as I have that it's not only imminent, but something that we're on the brink of? Thank you, sir. Yes. <laughs> I'm not a, a, a religious person, you know, but the phrase that comes to my mind when you say what you say is that, you know, the kingdom of God is at hand. I, I, I can't help but believe that. Um, maybe the reason I believe it so hard is because I, I need to believe that in order to get up, you know. But um, on the other hand, um, part of the reason why I need to get up is so I can keep believing that. It's sort of circular in a way, but, but I'm with you. Thank you all for, oh, you want to add to that? 
I was just going to say, I second that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you again to Toya Ruby Frazier and Fred Moten.